my name is Jordan Camp. I'm director of research here at the People's Forum, and I am delighted to be here with my uh, longtime friend and colleague, Kiega Yamada Taylor, to talk about her newest book, Race for Profit, How Banks and the Real Estate Industry Undermine Black Home Ownership, which is just out from the University of North Carolina. Thank you for taking the time. Yeah, I know absolutely. it's really busy in the middle of the semester like this. And I mean, you know, uh, this is your third book mm -hmm. since I've met you. Mm -hmm. um, you know, uh, from Black Lives Matter to Black Liberation. Um, also, you are the editor of How We Get Free, Black Feminism and the Kambahi River Collective, Collective both award-winning books mm -hmm. and of course, now with a third book in six years, which is just an amazing mm -hmm. accomplishment, um, you have now been long listed for the National Book Award. So yeah. I just want to start by congratulating you. These are Thank major you. achievements and uh, it's secured this well-deserved praise, already been reviewed in really influential uh, venues. And you intervene in debates of considerable urgency mm -hmm. about the political economy of segregation mm -hmm. in U.S. cities. You also explore the pervasive and persistent racism in housing since the 1960s yeah. and the passage of legislation. So I just want to start by asking how you came to the project. Sure. Um, I think that there, there's a functional explanation um, and then there's a much more uh, long and involved explanation that has some to do with my um, background uh, in organizing and activism and uh, being in the city of Chicago. So functionally, I was I returned to uh, school uh, to I was in Chicago. I dropped in and out of school over a period of time. Um, I went back uh, to finish a, a bachelor's degree when I was working as a tenant advocate uh, for a, a tent rights organization in Chicago. Um, and that basically meant I went to court with people to try to stop them from getting evicted or to extend their time in, uh, in their apartment. And so it was really through this job that um, I developed a deep interest in uh, segregation in Chicago, which if anyone's been to Chicago, it's profound. Um, it, for me, it was, I moved to Chicago from New York. You know, people describe New York as segregated. Mm -hmm. And then I moved to Chicago and it was like uh, on a, an entirely different um, scale. In fact, it was the first thing um, that I noticed in, in moving to the, to the city. And so um, I went back to school to finish my uh, BA and um, the person that I was working for had been uh, involved in housing struggles in Chicago over a long period of time. And so he told me, <coughs> he told me about uh, an organization uh, of black homeowners in um, the 1960s that had been, uh, had organized to fight for uh, access to conventional mortgages. Um, in the city. At that time, um, most black people who own their own homes own them on contract, uh, which were basically buying a, a house uh, through installment payments where you didn't actually possess the title, even though you were responsible for all of the financial demands of home ownership, you had to pay property taxes, you were responsible for the maintenance, you were responsible for everything, except you didn't own the house. And if you missed a payment, you were then treated as a renter. And mm -hmm. Uh, could lose your entire investment and then be evicted. Um, so I went to grad school to work on this. And, you know, I entered grad school in 2007 and uh, Beryl Satter, uh, who wrote a book called Family Properties, uh, which is about contract buying in Chicago, um, had already been working on this topic for several years. You know, when I finished my... Uh, uh, coursework in graduate school and had to um, immediately kind of uh, figure out a proposal for what I was going to write my dissertation on, her book came out. Um, and so, you know, my advisor and several other people read the book with me and they were all like, you got to find something else to write about. And so I had um, written a paper 
uh, on um, this program called Section 235, which was <coughs> one of the programs created by the 1968 Housing and Urban Development Movement, uh, or uh, the Housing and Urban Development uh, uh, Department. And I, um, uh, I was interested in this, in this topic, 2007, uh, 2008 was right when the housing market was collapsing, um, you know, and so I was interested in the parallels of subprime lending in the early 2000s and what had happened in these programs in the late 1960s, early 1970s also resulted in a wave of foreclosures uh, during that time period. So there are two kind of, one, I had to do it out of necessity and two, there's a deeper kind of interest in um, race and housing uh, and the federal government's promotion of single family uh, home ownership. And I think an important part of that was also in Chicago, uh, most of the discussion about race and housing had to do uh, with public housing. Mm -hmm. And, you know, and that, that's an important uh, area to look at. It's also the case that the vast majority of black people uh, get their housing in the private sector, mm -hmm. either as renters or buyers. And mm -hmm. so, um, you know, it is a little bit like what Toni Morrison says, you know, you write the book that you want to read. And I couldn't really find in the historiography much written about black homeowners or black homeownership. So, so that, that's kind of the winding way that I got to this topic. So your work <laughs> is about you know, racial inequality, uh, housing uh, policy, and kind of transformations of the political economy in this post-World War II mm -hmm. period. Um, why is it so important in your view to understand the relationship between, or the roots of racial inequality in uh, real estate practices? Um, well, there's, I mean, there's lots, there's lots of reasons, I think, one and I, you know, I write about these various aspects of this in the, in the book. That immediately when African Americans uh, are freed from slavery, um, the first iteration of civil rights is written in 1866 in the 1866 Civil Rights Act, and there's an immediate joining of citizenship and property ownership. That essentially to be a citizen means that you have the right to um, buy and sell uh, property. And so what then has it meant for African-Americans to uh, consistently uh, be marginalized um, from this enterprise to uh, when access is opened up for it to be on, on predatory, discriminatory, and uh, unfair terms, um, it says something important about uh, the meaning of black citizenship um, in this country. And so in that sense, real estate is an important way, an important measurement um, of the meaning of black freedom and black citizenship uh, in the United States. Um, and so that that's one aspect of it. I think related in the 20th century, home ownership has been such a essential cornerstone uh, of American democracy and American uh, citizenship that black people have both aspired to be um, homeowners and I think the marginalization from what homeownership means both in terms of belonging uh, of citizenship but also uh, of this access and possession of this financial asset mm -hmm. uh, for which so much of social mobility in our society is tied to that it's also been a source of tremendous radicalization. Um, and I would argue that um, one of the reasons why there has been so little written about black homeowners, um, in history at least, I mean, there are all kinds of studies in political science and in sociology, but they often tend to be empirically based uh, studies that are looking at uh, uh, disparity between um, numbers of black homeowners compared to, to whites and, and that sort of thing. But I think in, in history, um, it's such a uh, disappointing story. There is no happy, I mean, there are so many civil rights stories where 
even if the, the promise of what these rights meant were unfulfilled, that there's still some kind of, you know, narrative arc bending mm. towards justice. Right. Um, and in housing, it just doesn't exist. Right. It's like the Fair Housing Act is only passed, only passed because Martin Luther King is assassinated. Right. It fails in Congress in 1965, in 1966, in 1967. It's on its way to failing again. And Lyndon Johnson literally rolls around in Martin Luther King's blood and begs the Congress to pass this legislation, which they do, but is completely toothless and has no meaningful mm -hmm. uh, enforcement um, uh, mechanisms. And, and so fair housing is passed. There's a landmark civil rights case, uh, Jones versus Mayer, that uh, happens shortly thereafter. And then there's the passage of this HUD Act in 1968. And that's, you know, that's a kind of trifecta high point but very quickly thereafter, you see the futility almost in, in one sense of it all, that segregation doesn't really change, that the inclusion of African-Americans into uh, the conventional real estate market doesn't function in the same way that the inclusion of white working class people in the 1940s and 1950s do, does. It doesn't produce a black middle class. Instead, it, it creates this uh, wave of foreclosures um, around the country. And so there's there's no happy ending here. And so um, I think that's part of the reason why it's a story uh, that's not told. And we can see in the contemporary moment, you know, the, a few days ago, there was this blockbuster expose in Newsday, a Long Island Daily, about, you know, a three-year investigation into uh, racist real estate practices across Long Island. And it barely, it makes no ripple in like the, the you know, nonstop grist mill of cable news. There's no coming up for air to talk about this. And, you know, outside of Newsday, the New York Times ran a two column little piece about it. But it's just like, yeah, there's housing discrimination. Mm -hmm. You know, it's just part of the fabric of um, the inequalities that we talk about. Mm -hmm. you know? poverty, housing, you know, we just throw these words around. Yes. And um, I wanted to look more deeply uh, into that. And one of the, the interesting things, I think for me helped to um, crystallize why this is such an important point is Roy Wilkins, the uh, president of the NAACP, at one point at a congressional hearing is saying that, you know, I had always looked at um, jobs and education as the most important uh, aspects of the, the civil rights um, coalition. Like these are the two most important things we should be fighting around. And when I go out and talk to people, the main thing they want to talk about is housing. Mm -hmm. You know, the Kerner Commission, mm -hmm. one of the, they interview people in every city where there's a riot and the top explanation is substandard housing, followed by, you know, unemployment, followed by police brutality. And so for something that in the lives of ordinary black people is so important, we don't talk about it um, enough as a catalyst uh, of tremendous social upheaval uh, during this period. And so that's part of what I wanted to do. So there's a complicated argument you make about, you know, post-war housing policy mm -hmm. being at the root of the urban uprisings mm -hmm. of the 1960s and then in turn that the development of these new housing policies are inconceivable mm -hmm. outside of being a response to those those rebellions right and so I, I wanted to ask you you know if you could say a little bit more about that i mean one of the arguments you make is that these policies served as forms of containment yes um, yeah. so why is it important to connect housing policy to the urban rebellions well there's there's a, a couple of things. I think um, one is there's a there's a little bit of a of a longer history um, to this that finally it's the rebellions that become the last straw uh, that forces the federal government to finally um, act. But this question about what to do about housing is is one that persists throughout the 
uh, the post-World War II um, period. So the U.S. has never had a plan um, around housing, right? The, the, the federal government only in the 1930s comes up with its first set of um, policies regarding um, housing. Uh, but still, there's such a mismatch between the need for housing and what the federal government is actually in a position uh, to provide, because there is an understanding that this is the domain of the private sector and that the invisible hand of the market and the mechanisms of supply and demand will produce enough housing. And it's consistently shown through this period that that's untrue. So there's always uh, a complete um, lack of uh, safe, sound, and affordable housing that is uh, available to people. Um, at the same time, the, the U.S. government does begin to develop housing policies that um, are almost exclusively geared towards uh, white Americans. Um, so the U.S. subsidizes the suburbanization of white people. White people begin to leave um, cities. And so black people are simultaneously migrating into um, <clears throat> uh, American cities. And they are then confronted with this lack of uh, safe and sound housing. There is housing available, um, but it's slum housing. It's substandard and dilapidated um, housing. And as black people are moving into the cities, their incomes are rising. And it's the aftermath of the Second World War. There are the demands and the desires to be integrated into U.S. society as full citizens, which means being homeowners. Right. Um, and so there are different pressures that are being applied on uh, the American state. The third one is uh, the, the, by the 1960s, the white housing market is becoming saturated. Um, and so, you know, there is a, an important kind of pioneering role that the FHA assumes for itself that perhaps we can develop an urban housing market, you know, Black incomes are rising. There's housing available because white people are leaving. We can, you know, perhaps begin to uh, develop a small market around home ownership in the inner city. And so as early as 1954, the FHA um, develops an experimental uh, home ownership program for people who are located in uh, renewal areas. So spaces that uh, have been targeted for urban renewal um, practices. And, you know, this, this uh, uh, opens up an opportunity, but the FHA, the Federal Housing Administration, uh, does not lend money. They just guarantee the loans that banks make. So you still need a lender, and banks are still reluctant. Um, uh, reluctant is, is, is a nice way to put it. They're still refusing to lend. Um, to African Americans, which is why it finally uh, boils over into rebellion um, in the 1960s, because there simply is not enough uh, decent housing. But one thing that is important in terms of containment um, to understand is that even as the FHA is loosening its restrictions, is looking at these uh, issues in um, different ways, uh, it is always on the understanding that even if we allow for black home ownership, it will only be in the city. We're, mm -hmm. we're not interested yes. in having black people become homeowners in suburbs. And this is because they are as the guarantee, the, the, the people, the institution that guarantees uh, the loans of banks um, are deeply interested in this notion of property value mm -hmm. and the preservation yes. of property value and being, uh, in their minds, risk averse. And the presence of black people in uh, white neighborhoods um, is not risk averse behavior. It's very risky uh, behavior. Um, the FHA uh, has bought in completely to the eugenic driven notion that black people are inherently destructive uh, to property values and should be contained unto them unto themselves. So you can be homeowners and we'll try to facilitate that process, but you can only be homeowners in deteriorating urban right. uh, communities. And so this is 
this is a, a an idea that carries over into the uh, the new period because they are willing to jettison explicit redlining um, policies yes. and develop a black home ownership market as long as it is a black home ownership right. market. They don't want an integrated um, market because of the idea that integration means a collapse in property values. Right. And this is where you really intervene. I mm. mean, mm -hmm. this transformation has been studied by other scholars, but the arguments you make, I think, can, you know, challenge a tacit consensus mm -hmm. in the social sciences about the relationship between race and wealth, mm -hmm. um, what it means for black people to get access to those homes. I mean, you, you're, you're questioning uh, a kind of consensus narrative right at the heart of U.S. Oh, uh, yeah. housing uh, policy. And so why do you think this is so important to do? Well, I, you know, I mean, I, I think that some of these ideas, if there's a kind of through line in the books um, that I've written, it is about the relationship between race and capitalism. Mm -hmm the impossibility of black liberation and black freedom within capitalism, and then examining the veracity of that based on the actions of uh, US institutions. And so um, there's never been a, a period of, you know, I write this about the police in, in from Black Lives Matter to black liberation, that there is no golden age of policing. Mm -hmm. There's no point in time where we can look back and say, oh, if we could just get back to you know, this kind of policing, right. then, you know, we could begin to rebuild trust between the community and the police. There is no time, you know? And the more I thought about it, I was like, it's the same for real estate. Right. There's no period in the history of the kind of modern real estate practice, you know, so we could say for the entirety of the 20th century, and certainly into the 21st century, up to yesterday mm -hmm. when this expose of Newsday comes out where the bottom line of the real estate industry is not completely, totally, wholly bound up uh, with race and racial discrimination and racial exclusion. And so this is part of the, um, if I were to quibble with uh, Richard Rothstein's book, The Color of Law, um, one thing that I would say is that I think it is important to expose the extent to which the American state um, has been involved in um, promoting, reinforcing uh, uh, segregative practices um, across the country. I think that that is incredibly important. Um, but I think the kind of minimized role of the private sector in narrating that history is misleading. Um, to me, it's more important to look at the relationship between the private sector and the state to understand why the state acts in the way, um, the, the particular ways that it does, than just saying these are just state-based creations. Right. Because if you look at the relationship between, um, you know, the FHA, this kind of nefarious um, public agency, well, the FHA didn't create residential segregation. As early as 1917, the National Association of Real Estate uh, Boards forms. It's the largest trade organization of real estate brokers in um, the country. It was then, today it's called the National Association of Realtors. It is now. Um, this organization as early <coughs> as 1924 um, made it a condition of being a real estate broker uh, that you could not introduce someone of the opposite race into a, a neighborhood that was dominated by a particular race. Right. So in, in other words, that you couldn't uh, uh, practice integration, you know, as a real estate broker. And if you did, you would lose your license. You would lose your right uh, to participate. So that's one thing. The other thing is that black real estate, realtor is a trademark term from uh, the National Association of Real Estate uh, Boards. Black uh, real estate brokers could not join the, uh, this trade association, so they formed their own. So black real estate brokers are called realtists mm -hmm. um, because they couldn't join this, this organization. So that is the extent to how racist uh, 
Mm -hmm. um, this trade organization of real estate brokers is. So, as we know, or you know, maybe people don't know, but should know that whenever the federal government embarks on a new endeavor, they always recruit people from the private sector, uh, experts from the field to uh, use their best practices in federal policy making. And so it's no different, you know, in the case of real estate. So we said earlier that the U.S. first for foray into housing policy begins in the 1930s. Well, who do they go to to develop new laws and rules and regulations regarding real estate? Oh, they go to the real estate brokers. To you know, these are the experts of the field. They go to the mortgage bankers. These are the experts of the field. So they go to the people who have essentially perfected twisting racial stereotypes into actual uh, uh, practice within uh, their industry, so much so that they are dictating where people live uh, uh, in, in cities across the country. Now these people are recruited into government uh, to set policies. And, you know, of course, they bring their practices uh, along with them. And so there's this relationship <coughs> between the public and private sector uh, that consistently bend um, laws, rules, and regulation to the will of the, uh, the private sector. Mm -hmm. um, and I think related to that is part of what makes it difficult for the federal government, state governments, um, to actually enforce its own rules and regulations. Um, because in one sense, they have outsourced um, this service to the private sector and simultaneously, you know, today completely disinvested itself yes. from producing any housing. And so they are now dependent <laughs> on uh, uh, the real estate industry to produce housing, which of course then, then complicates your ability to effectively police them. Because if you police them too much, well, maybe they'll just get out of this altogether and you have already decided that we're not that that's big government right. that's like big communist government yes and we we don't do housing yeah so they do housing so it kind of means that you have to do what they want right. you know in order to maintain the relationship and this is you know for me this this explains so much about how they get away with these things in my you know we were t talking about the the expose from uh newsday in my class you know my students are like well but we have these laws regarding you know housing discrimination we passed a fair housing act why do these things continue to happen and it's like well the federal government has no commitment to enforcing its own rules and regulations otherwise this wouldn't happen this is all illegal everything in that expose is illegal and yet it still happens why? Because no one's being punished for it. Um, and, and why is no one being punished? Because as one newspaper described it in the Chicago Tribune when uncovering the, um, this HUD FHA housing crisis of the 1970s, it said that there was a sleeping bed relationship between the mortgage bankers, the real estate brokers, and the federal agents who were supposed to monitor what they were doing. And you describe this transformation, this race for profit mm -hmm. uh, throughout the 1970s, where, you know, real estate agents and banks really take the lead, evidently in desegregation. Yes. Uh, and in doing so, you know, create new sites for investment, new mm -hmm. sites for uh, accumulation. Mm -hmm. And that's the grounds where you introduce this concept of predatory inclusion. Mm -hmm to describe the ways in which African-Americans uh, getting access to credit they had been denied basically created uh, what you call a captive market mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. for real estate uh, agents and bankers to exploit right. that captive uh, market. So I guess the... What's but but now in an in age of colorblindness. Right. So they, they can't do what the contract buyers who also worked with bankers did then you walk into a bank for a loan and they say no this is a loss area 
And, you know, why? Because you're black and you live in a black neighborhood. Um, and so predatory inclusion in some ways is the, the opposite of that, where now there's indiscriminate lending um, to try to inflate the value of the houses in a market um, that otherwise uh, would be non-existent. Right. Um, and so, so I, I talk also some about zombie properties yes. uh, that are resuscitated uh, uh, through these programs and, and made valuable uh, again, not to African American families who live in these communities, but to uh, predatory investors. Um, so, in that sense, African Americans are essentially vessels through which capital flows mm -hmm. uh, from the neighborhood through them back out, um, but certainly not in any kind of uh, circular uh, invested um, way that black communities are sites of extraction. Um, not investment. And so one of the things that for me is important in um, trying to make sense of, of this idea of predatory inclusion is understanding the relationship between the past and the contemporary moment, meaning that it is the, the decades of disinvestment, um, of underdevelopment um, in these communities that then become, provide the pretext for the real estate industry, both brokers and bankers and builders uh, to then treat black people differently um, because of the kind of uh, disproportionate levels of poverty, uh, the distress of the, the housing um, uh, gives them the uh, excuse to say, these are risky neighborhoods, these are risky people, thus we can treat them uh, differently. And being treated differently almost always means um, having to pay more uh, for worse services. And so one of the ways <coughs> that this manifests itself um, is in banking. Um, commercial bankers that accept and hold deposits uh, and because of that tend to operate more responsibly, continue to refuse to do business in working class and poor uh, black communities, and instead, um, mortgage banks are the predominant uh, lenders in these neighborhoods um, through these new uh, programs. And so mortgage bankers uh, operate on the basis of volume, that they make their money not by holding deposits, lending it out, and then getting a fee for lending it out uh, based on you know rising or lower interest rates, but mortgage uh, banks uh, get their money based on the volume of loans that they make. So for each loan that they make, they get a fee. For each house sale that they close on, they get an even larger fee. And so the point is to get as many sales as possible. And this often leads to uh, one, a house that is in terrible condition being flipped one, two, three, four, five times so that that process of originating a fee and closing on a house sale happens over and over again. Um, and so activists in Chicago describe this in particular as fast foreclosure, mm -hmm. that mortgage banks are uh, interested in foreclosing as quickly as possible uh, to collect their fees and then initiate the process uh, all over again. This does not happen in normal, stable, um, conventional, housing market sales. Uh, this is happening in this weird market that is created just for African Americans, where the housing, so when the FHA sets up its programs in the 1930s originally, these are new houses, historically low interest rates. Yes. In the 1960s, they're not replicating the same program over again. These are old houses. These are in, in, in St. Louis, the average age of houses in black majority neighborhoods are 70 to 80 years old. So these are old houses that you're getting a 30 or 40 year mortgage on and interest rates are now at a historic high, right? right? And so these are uh, uh, conditions that are set up to fail. And in reality, failure is a part of, uh, of the game. Yes. Fa failure is a part of the speculative aspect 
uh, of this. Why? Because now the FHA has come in and said, we will guarantee all the loans um, in these communities. All these loans that we've previously excluded will now uh, guarantee all of them with no oversight. And so it literally cracks open this market that allows speculators to come in and take properties that in many cases had been condemned, had been you know, declared by the city to be unfit for human habitation, um, are now sold and cheaply repainted and, uh, and then you know, flipped to uh, typically poor and working class black women um, who were desperate for housing. Yes. Uh, and, and you know, they realized that the house is in disrepair and falling apart um, and with no help on the horizon, many of them walk away uh, from these homes and that process is initiated uh, over again. And so this is not um, uh, equality. This is not uh, the end of redlining and the now wholesome inclusion of black families. This is the continuation of predatory uh, practices within the real estate industry, just on different colorblind, color neutral uh, terms. What do you want the take home of the book to be? Mm. And mm -hmm. how can organizers, you know, um, struggling in cities mm -hmm. like New York and Philadelphia, uh, use your book in, in fighting for racial and economic justice? I think one of the most important things that I'm trying to uh, do with this book is to really expose um, the absolute incompatibility of private sector involvement in public policy making. Um, on a very basic level, it's not a question of if you like it or don't like it. Real estate is here to buy low, to sell high, and turn a profit. More power to you. That's, you know, go make your money, real estate. But public policy is supposed to protect the public's interests, public welfare. And those two, profit and the public interest and public welfare, those two things do not work together. And that is why we continue to see um, this failure in uh, coming up with actual, real, tangible, uh, housing solutions for people. I mean, people treat it like a mystery. It's not a mystery. It's in the hands of the private sector. The private sector is interested in profit. It is not profitable to house poor people mm -hmm. or to p house working class people. It's profitable to house rich people, right? They're the ones who are paying, you know, for a million dollar condos. That's profitable. Being able to, you know, pay for sturdy, good housing for, you know, a family of whatever, you lose money on that. And so as long as this is in the hands of the private sector, it doesn't get built, which is why I and other people have said, this isn't a housing crisis. A crisis indicates some breach with the norm. Mm -hmm. This is the norm, mm -hmm. right? There has not been enough uh, affordable and good housing for working class people ever in the United States, ever. Even when they were building public housing is never on the scale of actual need. There are tens of millions of people in this country who are paying 30%, 40%, 50% of their income to house themselves. So there is incredible need on a scale that only the state can satisfy, not the private sector. And so we have to get the market out of housing. Housing, if you think it's a human right, it should have nothing to do with the market. Same as with healthcare, same as with food, same as with the basic necessities uh, of life. And that is the, the, the second important thing for me with this book is to really examine the problem uh, with how American society has come to be built around uh, home ownership, right? That your access to this asset and whether you own this asset um, determines your quality of life. It, it is what unleashes social mobility in the society. And if you don't have it, then you lose access to those things. And that is, 
an embedded inequality. And so black people are precipitously losing access to this. The number of black homeowners is down to 40% with no particular end in sight. And so we think about how the house functions, that it creates you know, the ability to send your kid to school. It creates a, as an asset, the equity to uh, weather a financial or healthcare crisis that it ensures your ability to have a comfortable retirement, or if you even get to have a retirement. So what does it mean that 60% of the black population is locked out of this? And that we just accept that, well, some people get to have their own personal social welfare state and other people don't. And so what would it mean to disconnect those things from the ownership of this asset? What would it mean if healthcare was universal? or if college education was universal, or if food were universal, or if all of these things were not tied to your own ability to personally accumulate wealth. Well, one, it would take the hysteria out of protecting housing values away. I mean, this is really why white people over the course of the 20th century have always devolved to mob violence and insanity to keep black people out of their neighborhoods it's because for them too, yeah, this house, that's all we have. This is what is separating us from complete destitution. So we are gonna do everything in our power to protect its value. And so imagine if you were guaranteed things in life that didn't require you to have this thing, it would transform so much of our society. And so I think that we have to question the centrality um, of property ownership and home ownership uh, as the salvation, you know, to the American way of life uh, in this country. So those, to me, are the the two um, most important things to to consider. Well, I want to thank you very much. Thank you. I I could talk to you all night. I know, uh, <laughs> and I clearly could talk all night. But I want to thank you for for spending the time. Plug uh, race for profit out from the University of North Carolina. Press. Thank you so much. Thank you.